What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building an absolutely insane gaming PC build. Yes we've got a 3080, yes we've got a gold motherboard from MSI but we've also got the brand new G-Skill Trident Z Royal Elite the successor to what was already the most insane memory on the market. In this video, I'm going to run you through all the component choices, put the system together from start right through to finish, test it out with the biggest titles out there, and of course, see how good the system looks in the GeekerWatt montage that you guys know and love. So without any further ado, Let's dive into it after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. The Corsair K70 RGB 10 keyless champion series keyboard is one of Corsair's latest releases and builds a keyboard in an awesome 10 keyless form factor. The champion range has been specifically developed with top esports pros and builds on years of testing. RGB can be easily customized in Corsair IQ as usual, while durable PBT double shot keycaps and Cherry MX switches guaranteed for 100 million keystrokes keep you on top of your game. Learn more at the link in the description below. Let's come back to the most insane memory ever a bit later, but first take a look at the motherboard. MSI very kindly sent this out to me for a couple of weeks to take a look at. This is one of their latest motherboards, and yes, your eyes are not deceiving you, this thing is insane. If you take a look around the back, it's got all this like ridiculous shielding on it. And even the rear IO is one of the most, if not the most bonkers I've ever seen. So you've got two USB-C Thunderbolt ports with mini display ports in. So you can use these Thunderbolt ports uh, for actually plugging up to a monitor or something like that. You've got, of course, all your audio ports, two and a half gigabit ethernet, loads and loads of USB 3 ports. 10 gigabit USB-A ports, it's just insane. You've got Wi-Fi 6, 4 RAM DIMMs, support for 1, 2, 3, 4 Gem 4 NVMe SSD. It's insane. It's not going to be quite to everyone's taste, but it does look good, especially when it's box fresh like this one is. It's also going to work well for the theme of today's build, which is intended to just be absolutely, completely and utterly ridiculous. The RAM is the next part in that kind of absolute mad aesthetic, but first let's not get carried away, let's install the processor. Now some of you are gonna be a little bit confused, James, you've gone for the ultimate build, but you're using Intel. Well, the latest Intel chips on paper don't perform quite as well as their AMD counterparts. But when you take the pricing into account, the i9-11900K is better compared to something like a Ryzen 7 5800X, where this chip definitely wins out. If you want to go absolutely balls to the walls, then Threadripper is the one for you. But even here in the office, a Ryzen 9 or an i9 is more than good enough for even our video editing workflows. Moving on to the RAM, and this, I'm so excited for this. I always loved seeing those videos with the old uh, tried an elite memory but this stuff genuinely I'm struggling to contain my excitement this is the first time I'm opening this oh my goodness wow look at these oh my goodness look at them that's ridiculous and it matches the motherboard so well I know the motherboard's a little bit gold but these are just incredible wow look at the top of that to be clear I don't even want to guess how much these cost and they're absolutely extortionate but they look insane. I think this is a kind of sleeker design as well than the last generation and while this top kind of crystal area can look a bit tacky when off, I've heard that when turned on these things look incredible. So let's get the four RAM DIMMs into the four RAM DIMM slots and take a look. I'm so excited. Look at that. I mean that you could not get a better match if you tried. That is so silly. Oh my god. Goodness me. Once we've done that, then we can move on to the storage, which isn't bright, isn't sparkly, but it will sit behind one of the M.2 covers. This is Samsung's 980 Pro. If you'd like to learn more about this or basically any other M.2 drive we've ever featured on the channel, I've written reviews on the website. So check those out in the card section now, all linked as ever in the description below. This is a PCIe Gen 4 drive as well, which means you get those super fast speeds in the region of about seven gigabytes per second. Definitely worth the price premium, especially for a super high-end build like this one. The next step of the build then is to move this motherboard over into the case choice for today's system. Now the case I've gone for is actually the mini version of Lee and Lee's hugely popular 
011D. It featured in our recent top 10 case video for 2021, and for good reason. Despite being a so-called mini version, it's actually quite large with support for 360 more rads at the top and the bottom, although it is a little bit tight. You've got loads of room for fans, full-size ATX motherboard support. The only thing that's really particularly mini is that you have to use a smaller SFX power supply. Let's go ahead and get the case unboxed a little something like this. Now this case looks absolutely awesome. The build quality is really nice. You've got a decent IO with USB-C. You've got glass on the front and the side. All in all, it's just a really cool case in a really nice form factor. You want to remove all of the side panels. So for us, that's the top, both pieces of glass and the rear before then going ahead and actually screwing the motherboard into place. It's probably easier to lay the case flat on the table when you're installing the motherboard. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's easier if you're not having to fight gravity and your motherboard's not trying to fall over constantly while you're screwing it in. I'm starting to like the look of this already. Normally in a build like this, I would just go ahead and install the cooler next up. But I'm thinking the power supply might be a better choice. This case is a bit more complex to build in, especially for an inexperienced builder. So it might just take a couple of different attempts to get right. Let's do the power supply now while all the cables are really easy to access and move on to the cooler afterwards. Talking of which, here it is. This right here is the Cooler Master V850 SFX. Now, one of the quirks of this case, as I mentioned, is that you need a smaller power supply. This SFX unit is a perfect choice. It's also fully modular, which really helps with cable management. Although I think I might pop in some power supply extension cables, which I'll link alongside everything in the description below, just to make sure our build aesthetics are truly A1 today. Nicely done, and that moves us on to the CPU cooler. Now, this is Corsair's H100i Elite Capellix. It does come with these really nice RGB Capellix fans included, but I've gone ahead and picked up some white QL fans to swap them out with and really match up today's color scheme. You can't beat Corsair's QL fans when it comes to RGB. Now, I tried to go for a 360 millimeter radiator in a video I made in this case previously, which you can find in the card section now. But to be honest with you, the fit was just way too tight. And this 240 mil unit will do a great job of cooling down our 11900K. Let's go ahead and just get all the mounting hardware out the box and check out the installation process. Boys, we have got a problem. We need to install the back plate, as ever, and the motherboard does have a cutout, but the cutout is not big enough. Not only is it covered by the power supply, but it's covered by this white metal. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to take the power supply out, take the motherboard out, install the back plate, and then put the motherboard back in. I make these mistakes in the build process so you guys don't have to, so let me sort that out and I'll rejoin you in just a second. With one disaster safely averted, I'm going to go ahead and actually pop the radiator into the case around this kind of location, with the water block of course sitting on the CPU. Let's do the radiator and the fans first, and then I'll talk through actually how you install uh, the water block itself, which of course goes in conjunction with the back plate we dealt with just a second ago. In order to do this, you just need to take these included brackets, which slide on uh, to the bottom and to the top of the CPU water block, a little something like that, and then take the included thumb screws. These are what we're going to use to fasten the cooler into place. Pop these LGA 1200 posts around the CPU, slide the water block on top and fasten it into place with those thumb screws. It really is that simple. And once you've done that, the CPU cooler is in. Oh, and don't forget to add a drop of thermal paste. A tube comes included in the box, which is always helpful. That is really starting to come together. And I was about to say we should move on to the GPU next, but actually we've got a few more fans to install. I'm thinking three 120s at the bottom and three 120s at the top. Now it does look a little bit better to have these all in exhaust mode as the fans look a bit more uniform, but your temperatures will be awful if you do that. So make sure you have intake at the bottom and exhaust at the top or vice versa to give yourself a really nice uh, airflow through the case. These QL fans actually have a fourth RGB ring, which does help uh, when they're in intake mode at the bottom of a case. It's what really differentiates them from the slightly more affordable Allow series. But as I say, I'll link those and the Allows and everything else today in the description below. With the fans installed, I'll go ahead and wire those up later. But first we need to install the graphics card. Now this right here is MSI's RTX 3080 Supreme X. This design has to be one of my favorite GPU designs ever. 
ever. And you can learn why in our full review linked in the description below. With three large fans, it takes MSI's previous flagship Gaming X Trio design to a whole new level and fights really well the Strix card from Asus. You could pick up a 3080 Ti as well if you wanted a little bit more power, but I actually prefer the 3080 as a standalone GPU, given much better price to performance, even at inflated prices. With nice RGB lighting and a silver design that will wrap in really nicely with the build, I think there's only one way to see what this thing looks like inside the case, and that's to actually go ahead and install it. Now, weirdly, but I'm not complaining, you also get a mouse pad included in the box with the Supreme card, which is a nice little touch before actually revealing the card itself. Look at the size of this GPU. It's absolutely insane. It's massive. It looks incredible and it performs really well. It does actually give you a pretty decent performance bump as well over the Founders Edition 3080, as you can see from some numbers on your screen now. But don't go anywhere because we will be testing the full performance a little bit later in today's video. Hovering the GPU into the case and you can kind of see what aesthetic we're actually going for. That looks ridiculous. And we didn't actually have any GPU clearance issues with the fans here, which is something I was a little bit worried about. Remove the second and third PCI slots. For us, they're already removed and push back the clip on the slot itself. Go ahead and slide what is basically a triple slot GPU in a two slot form factor into place. Click it in. Oh my goodness. All that we need to do now is screw it into place to make sure it doesn't wobble and go anywhere. Get it powered up with some nice power supply extension cables. Plug up all the fans and then see how good the system looks when it's all powered up. In the only way we know how in an epic GeekoWatt montage. Roll that montage. Now that we've seen how good the system looks, it's time to take a look at the performance figures of our awesome Supreme X 3080 and Intel Core i9-11900K. On your screen now, as always, is a summary, a snapshot view of all the different performance numbers we were able to achieve with this system. I'll be looking at some of these titles individually in a second, but as ever, if you'd like to see the full unedited gaming benchmark runs, you can find those on our benchmarking channel in the card section now, with a full suite of benchmarks listed in our 3080 web review linked in the description below. So much content for you all to enjoy past this video. Let's take a look though at some of these titles individually, kicking things off with GTA 5. Here at 4K high settings, we achieved an impressive 120 frames per second. This is a really great result, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. You can easily repeat this testing for yourself in GTA 5 by copying all of our settings and hitting the tab key, which will give you an identical and super comparable result. Next up then is Watch Dogs Legion and at 4K high settings with DLSS enabled we got 131 frames per second. 118 and 102 for the 90 and 99th percentile results mean we got some super consistent frame rates. If you want to enable ray tracing you can absolutely do so and while your frame rate will take a little bit of a hit you'll still manage to achieve 80 FPS on average. Both of these results in Watch Dogs Legion were tested using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War is next up and once again we tested at 4K. Why would we do that? Why test 4K in a build like this? Well given how much power it's got and how much money it costs, we're assuming that you're probably going to pair it with a 4K TV or monitor. And if you do, the game will look great. Here at Call of Duty's Cold War, we got 112 frames per second uh, while leveraging the power of NVIDIA's AI-backed DLSS resolution scaler with strong 90 and 99th percentile results. Moving on to Apex Legends, and here we managed to achieve some insane frame rates at 4K high settings. Just under 150 FPS on average, uh, with really, really consistent results. Our frame rate here never really dropped below 119, while sustaining an average of 148. Valorant is next, and here at 4K high settings, we managed to achieve a really impressive 348 frames per second on average. Wow. With 90 and 99th percentile results of 295 and 260. We really were touching some incredible frame rate numbers uh, in Valorant and it really is impressive to see. Even if it is, of course, the easiest game uh, of all of our suite to run. 
Moving on to Cyberpunk and at 4K high settings with no ray tracing but DLSS enabled, we got 94 FPS on average while turning on that fancy ray trace lighting uh, knocks us down to 65 frames per second. Either way, you get some very playable results in what is undoubtedly one of the most tricky and poorly optimised games, if that's kind of a nice way of putting it. Moving on to Fortnite then, the penultimate title on our testing list, and here at 1080p competitive settings, we got 253 frames per second on average. 238 and 189 for the 90 and 99th percentile results gave us some solid results all around. Finally then, the last game today is a little bit of Call of Duty's Warzone. At 4K high settings with DLSS enabled, we got 121 FPS on average. All of the frame rate testing was done as ever with both MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner and Nvidia FrameView. If you'd like to buy any of the parts or learn more about them for today's build, links will be in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, get subscribed to see more from us. Thank you very much for watching though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.